Hello, I'm uh, City Council Member David W. Robinson, FAIA, and I want to welcome you to our kickoff panel discussion, part of our Houston 2020 Visions program. This evening, we have three esteemed panelists joining us for a discussion on the policy of resilience, and in particular, how Houston has implemented policy ranging from infrastructure projects to flood and warning systems and resilient housing design, uh, and all in particular implemented policy ranging of all forms of infrastructure. Uh, we'll talk more about what changes in our city has undertaken since Hurricane Harvey visited us in 2017 and how visions for improvement have turned to policy as with the Houston Climate Action Plan and Resilient Houston. Tonight's program is, going, is currently being recorded on Houston television and will be uh, here for posterity and for our purposes going forward with the program. But first, I want to share with you just a, a touch of background on the Houston 2020 Visions exhibition and how this exciting program came to be. So as we all know, uh, life changed distinctly on the Gulf Coast in late August in 2017 when Hurricane Harvey made landfall in Rockport, Texas. And the week that followed brought historic levels of precipitation across the region as the storm slowed and stalled out over the city. It flooded neighborhoods in Houston with over 50 inches of rain in a variety of diverse communities and far spread bayous. Tens of thousands of homes and hundreds of public buildings were destroyed, including the existing Architecture Center of Houston and the then under construction Architecture Center in downtown Houston. The Houston 2020 Visions program is a response to Hurricane Harvey and was launched in January 2018, first with the blessing of Mayor Sylvester Turner, and then in late January with AIA Houston's Board of Directors with a simple premise, namely that resilient design and urban planning uh, must be at the heart of our recovery and beyond and it can help us tackle some of our city's most urgent challenges by engaging architecture and our engineering community. Uh, and with this, our unprecedented collaboration between the city of Houston and AIA Houston has featured a broad range of project proposals that seek a more forward-looking and resilient future. On the one-year anniversary of Hurricane Harvey with planning from a dedicated group of stakeholders and steering committee members, we sent out a request for visions or RFV and received dozens of submissions over the next year. And with on the second uh, year anniversary of the storm, we concluded the competition and impaneled a group of expert national acclaimed resilience experts to serve on a jury. Uh, it was chaired by our uh, esteemed Bob Burkfile, FAIA and the original founding uh, chair of the Committee on the Environment out of Kansas City, Missouri. We had Ilya Azaroff, AIA, a specialist from New York City with great experience from Superstorm State Sandy. We had Jeff Abair from New Orleans and his expert leadership in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. And Alyssa Hoagland Ismailan from Dallas, Texas with excellent relevant experience in the Trinity River Corridor. And finally, our fifth panelist and jury member was Jaime Sobrino, an architect FAIA from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and currently practicing with the Miami chapter. Uh, our jurors then met in early October of last year and selected 27 project proposals for inclusion in this exhibit, divided into five clusters or categories of projects that featured the Prairie to Bay Ecology, Green Corridors, the Future of Buildings, the Future of the Energy Economy, and Hubs. In the coming months, following this introductory panel, we're preparing a series of monthly virtual panel discussions to pair with these five cluster of project topics, as well as our jury members and submitting architects and engineers to talk about the programs that are featured in the exhibition. So tonight, our discussion, as I have mentioned, I will serve as moderator. It is an introductory session to kick off this engaging series of programs. 
And with that, I'd like to introduce tonight's three panelists, all public officials from the city of Houston, and each of whom I've had the pleasure of working with in key positions and critical roles at the city of Houston. First is uh, Chief Resiliency Officer Marissa Ajo, um, and accompanying her is our Chief Recovery Officer, Steve Costello, my former council member and colleague, PE, and the Director of our Department of Public Works and Engineering, Carol Haddock, uh, from our Public Works Department. So with that, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight to begin this evening. And I know I'm, I'm hoping that each of you will introduce yourselves with a, a brief bit of background on your work in the field of resiliency. And Chief Ajo, if I could turn to you, let's, let's start the panel. Great, really excited to be with you this evening. Um, my name is Marissa Ajo and I am an urban planner um, and um, have been serving in the role of Chief Resilience Officer in Houston for um, a little over a year and a half. And it is a role that um, I have had the pleasure of serving in two cities, uh, created the resilience program um, in Los Angeles uh, under Mayor Garcetti prior to um, coming to Houston and getting to work with the Turner administration. Great, we'll go to you next, uh, Chief Costello. You're gonna need to unmute. There we go. Thank you for letting me join you this evening. Uh, I am a former consulting engineer and former city council member. As the council member has indicated, we were colleagues for quite a while. Uh, I, right after I was term limited, Mayor Turner asked me to join him in early 2016. He called me the flood czar and that label has kind of stick, even though post Harvey now I'm the chief recovery officer. Uh, really focusing on sustainability and flood damage reduction and look forward to the conversation we're gonna have this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. And with that, anchoring our team here, our director of public works and engineering, Carol Haddock. Uh, thank you, uh, council members. It's my pleasure to join this, this panel. Um, I get the, the pleasure of working with all of you on a daily basis, and, and I tell you what, it's, it's, it's certainly fun to tackle the challenges that Houston has as we do that. Uh, my, my background in the resiliency world, before I came to the city of Houston, I spent seven years at the Harris County Flood Control District, uh, where at one point I was responsible for Project Brace. And uh, it's a, a lot of long history in working in the flood um, reduction, flood damage reduction, uh, risk reduction world uh, before I came over to Houston Public Works. And now I get the, uh, the pleasure on a daily basis of working with building new infrastructure. Uh, our permitting center makes sure that new buildings uh, and new uh, infrastructure that's built uh, meets all of the codes so that it will be safe and resilient moving forward. Um, and then provide water and wastewater for the city of Houston as well. Um, all parts of uh, what we do on a daily basis at Public Works, we, uh, we focus on the fact that we are uh, that, that strong foundation for Houston to thrive because uh, we recognize that what we do is, is what everything else is built upon, um, not necessarily what Houston is known for. And when that infrastructure works well and our services work well, then we allow all of the other things that, that make Houston Houston to be resilient um, and make Houston uh, allow it to be what it wants to be. And that's, that's what I get to do. A nice introduction. Thank you, Director. And uh, with that, I think we're just going to dive right into some of the questions that uh, we have for you tonight. And uh, Director, I'm going to stick right with you with a question about what are some examples of new policies that have been enacted in Houston since Hurricane Harvey, especially those that focus on improving our flood resilience and maybe some of the specific projects there. Absolutely, so one of the things that we realized almost immediately as Harvey finally moved out of the region and we had um, tens of thousands of people that had been significantly impacted in their homes and businesses was that we needed to provide guidance to not repair just to flood again. And so one of the very first things that we did was we actually, uh, uh, worked uh, th to rec get council to, to recognize and, and uh, change the floodplain ordinance to recognize that we needed to build to a higher standard. Uh, because we knew that we had more intense and uh, more frequent rainfalls, we had new data that had been released by uh, NOAA, um, but had not yet made it into our floodplain maps, we actually modified our ordinance 
to use a proxy so that people that were repairing, people that were rebuilding, people that were building new would not build in harm's way and could build themselves out of harm's way. That was probably the biggest thing that we did. And I'll tell you, we did take some flack for that. Uh, the, the response that we got was that we are, we are hurting the people that just got hurt the most. Um, and to me, that's one of the biggest challenges when we talk about resilience is that a lot of times when you're trying to become resilient, it's because you haven't been resilient in the past. Um, and so um, you've experienced something that's, that people are wanting to not have to deal with all the consequences of what, they, what they've experienced. We also um, have, have continued to up, um, take away the, the grandfathering for previous development that didn't have detention. Uh, we've uh, looked at uh, different uh, design standards and things throughout that. We've made lots of changes to keep people out of harm's way that aren't there today. And then as things get rebuilt to make sure they don't go into harm's way. Uh, the projects that we're, we're um, building, going to be building in the future um, I'm definitely going to pass this off to our, our recovery czar, Steve Costello, here in a minute, because he is actually the one who has been chasing the money. I get to build them, but he's been the one that's been on the, the spear of finding the money to make it happen. And that's why this partnership is so good between our three offices. Um, so, Steve, do you want to talk about the projects? I will. Thanks, Carol. I, I think the one thing, Council Member, that Carol didn't mention is a phrase that the mayor has used, I think Carol had coined, we're not going to build back. We're going to build better. And, you know, all of those regulations and changes that Carol's team has put together, she didn't do that in a vacuum. Uh, she actually recruited the building industry, took them out, and obviously they didn't agree with everything that we proposed. But um, we, we did have, we came out with a consensus that I think everyone believes is a good consensus. Uh, so I'm really proud of everything her team has done. You know, relative to building resiliency, we... Um, Everybody knows that the proper investment in flood damage reduction, uh, for every dollar you spend in advance of a flood, you actually save $4 in damages. And so FEMA recognized that post Hurricane Harvey and allocated a little over $870 million to the state of Texas for flood hazard mitigation. Uh, so we were pretty aggressive in trying to get our share of that money. So we ended up getting approval for four different projects. Uh, so we got about 40% of the total dollars that were allocated to the state, we're pretty proud of that. Uh, four projects in particular, one is the conversion of a golf course to regional detention, which is a golf course that was previously bought by the city up on White Oak Bayou called Inwood. Uh, the second is the dam structure, putting new, new gates at Lake Houston Dam to allow for lowering of the dam in advance of a flood. The third is the actual North Canal project, which is a diversion channel downstream in uh, downtown Houston. And then the fourth is the one that we just got awarded, which is a subterranean detention basin on the west side of town. The two that I think are kind of unique, council member, has to do with, you know, we deal with building. So we're doing the structural improvements. But the mayor and the community wants quality of life features as well with these engineering structural improvements. So in Inwood, we're joint venturing with the Houston Parks Board. And so we're building the detention facilities with Harris County Flood Control Facility. And then the Parks Board is developing a comprehensive amenity package to dovetail with the structural improvements uh, and helping us raise funds, private dollars to do those improvements. The other one, which is the marquee project downtown, which is the North Canal, that has been on the books for 20 plus years. And fortunately now we have some money to actually build the project. It's a joint project with FEMA, City of Houston, Harris County Flood Control District, TxDOT, as well as Tourist 5, which is a memorial area tourist. Uh, so what's kind of unique about that is that we're working collectively with the Buffalo Body of Partnership. We're gonna build the structural channel and they're gonna come in with an amenity package to make it look something that the city would be real proud of in years to come. I, I know that so well, Steve, not only am I your colleague for a few of those years, but uh, as, as you know, I became the chair of the, the TTI, the Transportation Technology and Infrastructure Committee, uh, you know, right after Harvey. Uh, so, you know, what the director said about implementing some of these policies and, and programs, uh, you know that we've lived these together. Um, and I really value all of your input and, and collaboration. I think our, our newest newcomer to the city 
is, is our expert chief resiliency officer, uh, Marissa, maybe you could speak about what you've seen since you've been here, what projects are impressive to you with a relatively fresh set of eyes? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the Resilient Houston strategy process um, has a similar timeline uh, to the Houston 2020 visions. Um, and uh, was kicked off at the one year anniversary of Harvey as well. And um, I think the opportunity that existed for me to come in and uh, help the city create that, that strategy and that, that new framework um, was really because of all of the phenomenal efforts that were underway. And it was a way of taking all of these various projects um, and programs that were moving forward and being able to stitch them together much like a quilt um, to show how uh, um, you know, everything was really connected and, and be able to provide a, a vision for, um, for the future. Council member, I just want to interrupt real quick because really Marissa has kind of underestimated and understated all the work that she did. She came in here with no staff and developed a resiliency plan that is pretty incredible. And uh, fortunately, I share a wall with her. So I hear all the efforts that she's working through and all the committees she's on, and it's pretty amazing effort. And uh, you know, I, I told her that we all wanna work together to implement all the projects that she's identified in that resiliency plan. Well, I, I agree with you, uh, Chief. And uh, I know one of her most endearing qualities is her modesty, which is uh, overstated um, for, someone who's so incredible for our city. So I, I want to stick with you, uh, Chief Aho, on the following, because there are, you mentioned the quilt, and I'm thinking about the tailoring of our resiliency program to the special character and dimensions of the city of Houston, and how our policies and projects are unique here, especially with your experience in LA, um, you know, part of this exhibit with an underwriting grant from AI National is that it travel and perhaps help other cities understand the process of considering resiliency for their own regions and municipalities. So maybe you could speak to that. Sure. Well, I think the way that we define resilience is really important place to start. Um, and for the city of Houston, that has been around equity, climate, health the built environment and the economy. And a lot of the uh, structure that we've created uh, really mirrors what the Houston uh, 2020 Visions has done. Um, there are uh, alignments everywhere. Um, and I think in terms of uh, other cities, um, the other thing that the, the Houston strategy really has advanced and something that we started in LA, and I think that's part of the reason why I, um, I'm in Houston is because it resonated with um, the folks in Houston is by looking at resilience uh, at a scalar level. And so the framework that we've created is all about individual resilience first and planning for people uh, and then really focused on neighborhoods in, in because, because each neighborhood is going to prioritize different sort of resilience shocks and stresses um, and the, to the extent that we can look at the neighborhood scale uh, to solve for those. And that's a lot of what uh, Carol and Steve have been doing, our, our neighborhood-based solutions. Um, and then looking at the bayous and the 22 watersheds and the role that they play uh, in the resilience work. Uh, and then the city and the city's role, but the city really can't do it all and needs a whole lot of partners. And then finally, uh, the last scale that we looked at was at the region level because the shocks and stresses, the issues that we deal with on a daily basis don't actually know municipal boundaries and the uh, level to which we need to partner with uh, regional partners, state partners, federal partners, et cetera, is super important. And so I think those, those types of um, uh, approaches that really mirror in what has been done with AIA and, and Houston 2020 visions really complement the approach that we've taken um, for resilience overall and really looking at the intersection of the shocks and the disruptions at the same time the underlying stresses um, because we know our most um, 
uh, vulnerable people, places, and systems are sort of disproportionately affected when there is a disruption, whether it be small or large. That, that's so valuable. And I know your work with other cities on their own resilience efforts has, has already brought uh, great value to our city. And, 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 and thinking about the diversity of Houston, it is another uh, favorite uh, category for Mayor Turner to think about the unique nature of our diverse neighborhoods. And, and I, I, I want to get into that a little more with you, not to mention the social equity piece that you, you brought up. But if I could turn to you, uh, Director Haddock, if, if you mentioned the, the Braves Bayou and some of the work you've done with the county over your career, uh, the 22 watersheds that Chief Ajo mentioned, you know, they're all unique. And I uh, wonder if you could speak about that in, in now your role of leadership. Uh, so absolutely, thank you. So one of the things that when I get an opportunity to talk about Houston and other parts of the country, because everybody thinks of Houston as a city that floods, is that Houston is, is a fairly young city. And we, if you look at uh, our 100 year floodplains, the, the, you know, those, those, those areas that um, statistically show that they have a higher chance of flooding uh, during a rain event, of the 80,000 structures that currently reside in those floodplains, more than nearly 80% of those were built before we had our first floodplain ordinance, before we had our first floodplain map, and before we had the rules in place that we have to keep people out of, out of harm's way. So even though we're a young city, we're very developed when we to look at flooding as, a, as something to be um, avoided, something that needed to be built around, um, and now, actually, with the, the way that Marissa is approaching it, it's not even necessarily um, about avoiding water. It's about living with water. And how do, how do we adapt ourselves and our community uh, in a way that we accept where we are on a coastal plain, that we, we build smartly, that we build in the right places, we don't build in the wrong places. Um, but we have a legacy of tens of thousands of structures which equates to hundreds of thousands of people that are in a place today that is not necessarily um, it, it, low risk for flooding. So how do we take that and bridge ourselves to resilience? And that's, that's where that neighborhood and community specific and, and almost house by house, looking at what is the cause of the, the, the threat at this location and what are the ways to address it? Um, and so the, the flood control district, my, my experience in that, they're doing very large watershed projects and they do have reductions in floodplains across the, the area, but they're not gonna address every single threat that we have. And that's why getting into the communities individually is so important. Yeah, I think that that is critical. And, uh, you know, among the experts here, I know our, uh, our chief Costello with his practice and, and building floodplains with all the diversity across the region. Um, Chief, if you could speak to your experience and the diverse nature of the projects you've already introduced. Yeah, so it's it's interesting coming from private practice and then being a, a bureaucrat. And, and, and what it is is uh, just the, the general feeling in the public about flooding. And over the years in my private practice, we, we always advocated for infrastructure investment. And what was happening was that we'd have these big floods like every five to eight years and people would be impacted. And it was normally a small percentage of the community. And then two years later, they would be back to their normal lives and everybody would just kind of forget. And so there was never this push for, yeah, we need to invest in infrastructure. And then you fast forward to 2015, two floods, 2016, Harvey in 2017. And what's happening now is the public is willing to invest in stormwater infrastructure because they recognize that not only can they get flooded by the 22 watersheds and stream overflow, but they can get flooded by inadequate, undersized urban infrastructure. So they realize that their two of them are connected. And so if you think about it, in 2018, the community passed a $2.5 billion bond issue for Harris County to do regional flood damage reduction projects. And then they reauthorized what we call Build Houston Forward, which was formerly Rebuild Houston, for another six plus billion dollars over 20 years for Carol and her team to deliver the water through urban infrastructure down to their facilities. 
And so that's, uh, that, that is a remarkable change in the public sentiment about drainage, flooding, and investment in infrastructure. And as like Carol is, when she's out in other areas and other communities talking about what the city's doing, I do the same thing to remind them that yes, we flood in Houston, but we've learned a lot and we're doing, we're doing the best we can with the investments that we have. And I also remind them that through Carol's team and their effort in changing our floodplain ordinances and adopting stricter ordinances over and above FEMA minimum standards, that she has the highest ranking of a major metropolitan area in flood damage reduction than any other city does. And as, result, as a result, she's saving us, was a 25% reduction in, in flood insurance expense for every person that buys flood insurance in the city because of that. And so it's, it's pretty amazing, as Carol said, yeah, we, we flooded here, but that was because construction was done long before people knew about floodplains. And ever since 1980, we are doing what we do best is provide protection to our community. Right. And again, with the expertise assembled, some of the global strategies we've seen in the Netherlands and elsewhere, we're living with water, uh, you know, making room for the river. In our case, with all the different watersheds, uh, there's a whole lot of retreating or strategies need, that need to be implemented to get uh, folks out of harm's way. Uh, we've also heard um, in various trips, I know, uh, Chief Costello, that I've made with you both to the Capitol in Washington as well as in Austin to talk to local officials. Uh, we've heard the adage that there's, uh, there's no, no such thing as a road project that's not a drainage project. And similarly, there's, uh, there, it's important to integrate our infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. So great that we're working with that. I wonder staying with you on some of those trips and thinking about the buckets that were referred to, the individual dollar designations that are coming from FEMA or from HUD and elsewhere. If you can talk about what that process looks like on the inside, shepherding through some of the major policy changes that we've seen. And if you've had any unexpected challenges or encountered anything, any unexpected allies or or difficulty with that process. Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, so in dealing with FEMA, we deal with FEMA on the hazard mitigation grant projects that I described to you, but also on what is called public assistance. Post the flood, they help us rebuild. And there are some programs within public assistance that seem, you kind of head scratch yourself and you say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't apply in a specific area. Like for instance, in one of these older neighborhoods that's well below the banks of a bayou that a house shouldn't be there, FEMA has a buyout program where it's called the tear down rebuild, but the maximum amount of money they would pay is $150,000. Well, if you're in Meyerland, I mean, in an, in an affluent neighborhood and the house is valued at twice that, you can't use that program where it makes sense to use that program to buy the house, tear it down, elevate the lot, and then put a house on it. The other program that we're dealing with with FEMA is a has a mitigation grant program is elevate home elevations. And so every year we apply for home elevation grants to help them. So the federal process is a little cumbersome. Also, what people don't realize is on the federal process is the dollars don't flow directly to the city. It flows through a state agency first. Uh, so, you know, we're dealing with on FEMA dollars with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. Now on the HUD side, the HUD money that we normally get from recovery flows through the general land office to our housing department. But HUD has a brand new program that came out this uh, two years ago, which is uh, CWG MIT, and that is MIT meaning mitigation. So we're chasing several several hundred thousand several hundred million dollars of projects through GLO through HUD on mitigation effort. And there, what we're doing is we're respecting what the resiliency program came out with, which is social equity. And we're identifying these areas where we can put capital projects in to provide benefits to areas that historically wouldn't meet the federal guidelines of a BC analysis. And so fortunately with HUD, we don't need to do that type of analysis to justify our projects. So Steve, I, I really want to tag on to that just for a minute, because I think it's really important for, for people to understand that the, the way that the money came to the local entity was you had to do a, a benefit cost ratio. And so the right. value of the structure and the value of the land compared to the cost of the project 
uh, was what drove federal investment to deal with flooding, flood mitigation infrastructure, not mitigation, but flooding recovery yeah. infrastructure in, in local entities like the city of Houston. Well, if you just look at um, how land development happens, um, where the land is less expensive is typically where the flooding risk is higher in Houston. And so those areas with a higher risk of flooding and those areas with less expensive housing never met the federal equation to get federal investment to address flooding. And, and it, it's not anything that anybody locally did. It was actually how the federal programs were written and how they were funded. Um, and so it really, um, not through anything that anybody locally at the city of Houston did, but it really did create some inequities in investing in flood infrastructure throughout the city that we're trying to address today. Yeah, and you'll see that with the projects, uh, the public will see that when we roll out the projects that we're chasing, where, why we are intentionally putting them in areas where they've been underserved, theoretically. Right, and it does begin to touch on some incredibly uh, complicated issues about federal policy, state policies, speaking of coordinated policies, and, and Marissa, again, with your uh, fresh eyes relatively in, in Houston about um, uh, working together and collaborating. I wonder if you could comment on that uh, from your perspective. Yeah, so one of, one of my surprises has actually been, um, you know, how easy it really has been to coordinate um, on multiple levels, multiple scales internally and externally. Um, not to say that we don't run up against roadblocks here and there, but um, you know, one of the things that we've done that I'm pretty proud of is creating um, not not new positions, but but new liaisons in the form of um, department resilience officers in every single department in the city in order to um, help implement the the goals and targets and actions in the resilience strategy and coordinate. Um, uh, across multidisciplinarily and uh, and really take advantage of, of multiple department strengths and how we can, I, I like to say, solve for more than one thing, given the urgency of everything that we're dealing with. Um, and we had our seventh meeting this week and just the, the way that everyone is collaborating on solving these issues is really phenomenal. And we've seen that um, with external partners and we've seen that in um, you know, Texas is blessed by having three chief resilience officers um, in three of the major cities. And so we're also working um, on, on sort of a Texas resilience network approach um, that's, that's been delayed slightly due to COVID, but hopefully we'll, we'll keep going. And I think there is, of course, the resilient uh, cities network um, that is the global way that we participate um, and really enjoy collaborating with, uh, you know, 100 plus cities or so around the world. Yeah, that, that is so helpful. And it reminds us of uh, the diversity of the challenges that we can get here. We're focusing on a lot about uh, flood events and rain events and hurricane events while we're still in the season. But it's, it's not long ago that Texas was facing a historic drought in 2011. And uh, I know a lot of what is encapsulated in the Houston 2020 visions is really thinking about a broad approach to a whole host of disaster relief. And again, thanks to this group for being able to, to bring some light to that. I wanna shift a little bit. We were talking about housing policy, which will certainly be touched on throughout the latter panel discussions that we have in the course of Houston 2020 visions. But another large topic that is politically sensitive and uh, you know, depends on depending on who you ask, climate change uh, may or may not be real. But if we take it as science, and we, based on our experience, are working with uh, what Houston has recognized, uh, not only with the recent declaration of Climate Action Week earlier this year, but as we we've, we've also published a comprehensive Resilience Houston uh, strategy which was spearheaded by Marissa Aho and a great leadership and experience that she's brought to our city. I wonder, uh, Chief Aho, if we could start with you, if you could speak on some of the highlights of that initiative. Sure, well, I'm happy, happy to talk about some of the climate efforts in, in general. Um, really, um, 
you know, Houston is experiencing climate change. Uh, we know that. And, and so um, it's been a real pleasure to work with our Chief Sustainability Officer, Lara Cottingham, um, who also released the Climate Action Plan this year. Um, the resilience strategy focuses on climate mitigation, um, the, sorry, on climate adaptation, and the, the Climate Action Plan focuses on climate mitigation. And so we need both, and we need to be working on both at the same time. And one of the real, um, you know, pleasures in working with her team and others was to recently, uh, as part of uh, Houston's first climate week, we released the climate impact assessment for the city of Houston and the larger region. And so we um, worked with Catherine Hayhoe, who is a great climate scientist, to look at 25 uh, indicators around uh, precipitation um, and really showing that we need to plan for the extremes and something that I love to call precipitation whiplash. Uh, and then around drought um, and, and what the projections are to 2050 and 2100 around drought. And then a whole series of indicators around ur um, urban and extreme heat, extreme heat specifically. And those indicators are showing that Houston is going to get even hotter. And for someone who is almost, almost done with their second Houston summer, um, really looking at um, uh, all of those climate indicators out to 2100 in a, in a low um, emission scenario and a high emission scenario and what we need to do to address climate all at once. We've also done a, recently an urban heat um, mapping exercise with a lot of community scientists that we conducted uh, with social distancing, including um, you know, 320 square miles of mapping, and we're going to get that data back as well. And so I think all of this climate science and all of this climate data is really going to help us be able to look forward for the next generation or two and be able to plan and integrate um, even more so than we are today. Uh, thank you very much. I want to take a pause before I turn it to our other experts about uh, your work and integrating some of their work with the Resilient Houston plant. But I want to uh, encourage visitors and those who have access to the question and answer function on our chat space, either one, if you could please let us know if you have any questions for our panelists. We're going to try to answer those a little bit later here in the hour, but also uh, use those as a way to get back to you and be as responsive as possible as public officials. But uh, Director Haddock, if I could turn to you about some of what Chief Fajo said, and how do you see your world changing to become a more resilient city? So I, I'm going to start off with the, the, the phrase precipitation whiplash that Marissa <laughs> just, just threw out there. As we were heading into um, Tropical Storm Imelda um, just last year, uh, we actually, in the 10 days before that, had gone in uh, from, the, from abnormally dry to uh, uh, moderate uh, to the point that we were actually showing up on the drought record. And then we had Tropical Storm Imelda, which actually has a national record for the most amount, you know, amount of rain in a 24-hour period. And so I, it, it's a perfect example of, of what you're talking about in that precipitation whiplash. And how does that impact me? I'll tell you what, where it makes me the most nervous is on water supply. Mm -hmm. Because we have surface water lakes that were built and permitted and planned to be used around a traditional type of precipitation that we get year round. And so we use some out of the lake, it fills back up when it rains. We use some out, fills back up as it rains. And this, this goes in a cycle. Well, when we're going through longer periods of drought and we're going through less often but more intense rainfall, will our lakes operate the same way and will our water supply be resilient to future changes? And th those are questions that I, you know, people have asked me in the past, what keeps you up at night? Those are the questions that keep me up at night as I worry about those types of things. Um, we're, we're going to adapt the, the, the incremental ad adaptation of our building codes and of our, our, our infrastructure on the local level and things like that. But where we have to begin to really worry about is, is those, those extremes of rainfall. Um, you know, that, that pipe that we built under the street for, I don't know, one to two inches of rain in an hour, and we're getting four and five inches of rain in an hour. 
um, it, it really is going to tax um, our infrastructure and it's also going to, in a long term, how we, we prepare for more growth, more density, um, and resources going to support that. Well, I know you've been on that end of uh, the discussions with a lot of our town hall engagements and capital improvement meetings that we've had around town. And, and Chief Costello, you too have been proactively trying to utilize the tools that we have at hand, the, the heightened meteorological sensitivity that we have in predicting storms paths and director working with uh, city leaders to know when to anticipate lowering the level of uh, Lake Houston, for instance, or to work uh, further upstream with Lake Conroe and to try to think about uh, activity on the San Jacinto or in other watersheds. Uh, so Chief Costello, kind of in, in that, what, what can you share uh, about working with some of your enhanced tools? Yeah, so just to follow along with what Carol said about the change in rainfall, what you didn't mention that's a challenge to her team also is the water quality. And, you know, she has to deal with surface water treatment, whether it's during a drought, entirely different than when she gets a huge flush from a, a major storm event. So that creates significant problems for Carol as well. Um, in looking back at, at climate change and, and what we're talking about in terms of climate, just look at why and what we're doing now. Over the past 30 years, I've been in this business for a long time, and we've changed our design criteria for storm events incrementally until Harvey. And over the past couple of years, we've now changed our design to about 30% more rainfall for a standard 100-year event. Uh, and as Carol said, that is exceeding the capacity of our prior infrastructure that was designed years ago to a totally different storm. And so we have to think differently about how we do that. Uh, so that's uh, that has been a challenge. We call it Atlas 14. And Atlas 14 before Harvey was a lot less than what Atlas 14 is post Harvey. And I think uh, when NOAA was identifying those numbers, they, they thought it was pertinent to put it into the statistical analysis, which is why we do that. I think the other thing that we need to be mindful of that our sister agency is doing is they're trying to come up with a way of forecasting floods. Right now, Harris County Flood Control District has on their website, you know, all their gauges so we can look at, okay, what's happening real time right now. Uh, then they, what they do is they modified their system to show um, within 15 minutes when a flood is occurring, where the flood's occurring. What they're now trying to do is they're now trying to work with NOAA to figure out scientifically if they can advance, predict a flood within 30 minutes to an hour. What I've been advocating for is something that I wanted something different is, and I'll show you, I want to be able to have my phone while I'm driving in the middle of the night in a driving rainstorm and I'm approaching in, in like an underpass to tell me don't go into that underpass and how quickly can it tell me that so I can get off the road. That's really what we got to get to. We got to be, because everyone carries this with us and floods always occur in the middle of the night when you can't see anything. On and a holiday. On a holiday. Yeah. And what, what? you drive into an underpass and it's got this big old ruler on the side of the wall that you don't see. And, and so it's, uh, and because Carol and her team put barricades up to prevent people from going in there, however, they drive right through them. And so, uh, so there's a number of forecasting efforts that are going on right now, both in terms of within the city and outside the city and encouraging researchers to come up with this plan I want them to do. That's great. What you're doing with your cell phone driving in the middle of a storm at midnight is another question, but I'm going to give you a pass on that one. Uh, well, he doesn't have to have it in his hand. It'll go off really loud next to him. Okay, I'm not sure how resilient that uh, strategy is, but um, sticking with you, maybe um, uh, Chief Aho, if you could just maybe speak to any other aspects of either the Climate Action Plan or Resilient Houston to think uh, what people might not know or other strategies that are uh, built deep into the, the the woodwork here, if there's other aspects that you'd like to highlight. Sure. Well, so one of the things that uh, I did right before we kicked off uh, tonight was um, look at the focus areas for um, the Houston 2020 visions. 
and be able to align a lot of those themes with specific actions that we have in Resilient Houston. Would that be a good way to approach this? That'd be great. Thank you. So um, in terms of, uh, and I will do my best to pull them up, uh, the future of buildings. Um, Resilient Houston focuses on modernizing our building codes um, and working with Carol's team in, in order to do that. Um, and we, we know that um, you know, a lot of the sustainability and resilience measures that are in our building codes are things that we strive for. And so we've worked with um, the housing department in order to create a resilience checklist for some of our multifamily uh, buildings where uh, developers can pick and choose which types of resilience elements they'd like to include into uh, their projects as, as sort of a best practice, which we're really proud of. Uh, in terms of um, the future of the energy economy, of course, uh, Houston wants to keep their energy crown or our energy crown, but by leading the energy transition. And so we've looked at um, ways that we can uh, continue to do that. And that's also a huge focus of the climate action plan. And then in terms of um, prairie to bay ecology, of course, um, that's a huge focus of the resilience strategy related to our bayous and also uh, calling for more biodiversity tools um, and ways to expand our, our e ecology tools. In terms of green corridors, um, you know, there's been a, a growing focus on green infrastructure and being able to really expand to get to the tipping point where green infrastructure isn't um, something that you see every once in a while, it's really integrated uh, in with all of our great infrastructure and is part of the norm. Um, and so that's uh, a lot of the focus of the resilience strategy actually. And then um, finally, in terms of hubs, one of the things that um, resilience officers around the world are working at um, is creating neighborhood resilience hubs. And in Houston, I love that they're referred to as lily pads. And so uh, the resilience strategy also calls for um, looking um, at expanding and, and what, what a lily pad network would look like um, in Houston and how can we move forward with that. Well, thank you. That's a great uh, introduction to our, our future panels. In fact, the first one in uh, November will be featuring the lily pad network. It's a, a visionary submission to the Houston 2020 Visions program submitted by Stantec and uh, elevated in a way that I look forward to seeing live and in person at the Architecture Center. Um, so we'll talk about that in one moment. And we do have some questions coming in now in our chat and Q&A space. So thank you for that. I'm going to wrap up this part of the panel discussion with one final question to you all. And uh, I know it was mentioned earlier, aspects of social equity and what we've seen perhaps with the current um, disaster that is COVID that was again unforeseen uh, by most of us and uh, surprise here it is and uh, I guess with that the challenges that we face if there are any um, ideas about social justice that we'd like to emphasize on the panel today. Anyone want to take that one? I'm happy to take that one. Please. So um, equity and inclusion uh, were a huge part of uh, how we looked at the resilience strategy framework. Um, and, um, you know, we have actions and goals that specifically talk about um, leading, uh, looking at uh, equity training, racial equity training, looking at um, equity indicators, similar to other cities have done. Uh, being able to evaluate our policies around equity. And so we have quite the, the framework um, in place that we're, we're trying to move forward. Another way that we're really focused on equity is working with um, Mayor Turner's Complete Communities team. And that is something that all of us do in terms of um, being able to take the projects that we're working with and, and make sure that they align and, and can be part of the investment into the 10 communities that are part of the Complete Communities Program that have been historically underinvested in. Um, and so I think, you know, equity is a fundamental part of our resilience work and has been embedded uh, from day one. But with COVID, um, I uh, helped lead uh, the health equity response for COVID. 
And we've created a COVID addendum to the resilience strategy that helps really tie um, all of the underlying um, sort of priority areas that we were looking at prior to this year um, with uh, how, how those um, actions will help us in our COVID response, recovery, adaptation, and institutionalization, and equity is a huge part of that. Great. Uh, excellent. I want to hear from Director Haddock how that has uh, maybe changed your world or with, uh, with uh, equity, what are we doing in the neighborhoods and around Houston? You know, and, and I'm going to take a slightly different spin on it than, uh, than my colleague is in, in, the, in the sense that um, it, it, when we're looking at going into neighborhoods, um, each neighborhood definitely has to be considered for what, for what they want. Um, but we, we also, um, and I will say, uh, and I will own that traditionally we have not always designed our infrastructure in a way that um, did equity and uses of structure. We focused on, um, we focused on, and, um, and I do sincerely apologize. I'm getting a note that my, my internet is unstable, but um, that, that we didn't focus on every way that members of that community might need to get to other places, might need things to get to them, might need, you know, and so we, we didn't necessarily focus on providing um, sidewalks, walkable solutions and providing um, bike facilities and providing access to parks and providing access to transit and providing access to all of the things that make our communities our communities. Uh, and so, um, it's not social equity in the same sense what Marissa was talking about, but we're actually seeing in how we approach our um, public works projects that we're actually looking at um, looking at more equitable um, um, evaluation of the needs of the community in the community that we're doing the project. Uh, the social Marissa is talking about is where the projects are going uh, more so than even the um, the, the projects. You know, once we get into, we're going to do a project here. We're asking a different set of questions than we asked even just five years ago. I know. Yeah, just a council member, just to follow that thought. Mm -hmm. uh, several years ago, the mayor created the SWAT program, which has been very successful. And you know, years ago, Public Works did big projects that took multiple years to do. Whereas now, what we're doing is we're driving into these neighborhoods where there are small projects that we can do in a very short period of time. The council members, each council member has an opportunity, has a budget every year to respond to those needs of the community. And it's amazing if you just do one small project in a neighborhood, the kind of reaction you get from the neighbor is saying, hey, they really are helping us because they see it in their neighborhood rather than some major thoroughfare that they're driving on that's taken several years to build. And so I think where Public Works is changing the thought process is that there are layers of projects just like Marissa had described the layers of her resiliency. We have these very major big thoroughfare projects and we're drilling down to even smaller projects in the neighborhood. And that, that's, been, that's been, been, it enables the city to spread the money around so that every district is benefiting from those activities. Excellent. Um, and I know our time is running quickly short here. We do have a, <clears throat> a number of questions in the chat and Q&A space. So I want to turn to that now, panelists, if I could. And I, I think this one I'm going to suggest is more or less right up your alley, Chief Costello, with a question about the planning efforts in collaboration with the Army Corps of Engineers regarding uh, reservoirs and any changes to improvements to them uh, upstream, new, elsewhere, things that you can share of that nature. Yeah, so the Army Corps came out with their, what they call a Colonel's Interim Report on Buffalo Bayou. And it's a study of the existing conditions of Addicts and Barker and figuring out what improvements they can do to enhance or improve that existing structure. Uh, they've made some recommendations for the community to consider. It included a reservoir up on Cypress Creek and some downstream improvements along Buffalo Bayou. I forwarded that report to Carol and her team. They haven't had an opportunity to look at that yet. So we are, as a city, are going to weigh in on that particular effort. I've talked to Harris County Flood Control District. They're doing the same thing, even though they're the local sponsor. They didn't do the analysis. So there's going to be an ongoing discussion about how we approach that particular effort. You know, 
for years now, everyone has been saying, go back and re-excavate Attica and Barker totally. And the Corps didn't really address that to the level of detail people wanted them to do. So I think that's gonna be probably the number one comment that you're gonna get from a lot of people here, particularly on the West Side. So I wanna tack uh, onto that if you don't mind, because I, the next question talking about um, straightening channels, which is, um, um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, is not actually a practice that is happening much today. Uh, for the most part, we're looking for more natural solutions while we recognize that we have to add capacity to channels. Um, in some cases, usually we're looking at, at partnering that with detention. We're creating those parking lots for excess stormwater uh, that we partner with channels. Um, and it's really, you know, when our, typically our, our partner, and it's the Harris County Flood Control District partnering with the Army Corps of Engineers for these very large projects, but they're not looking at what we imagine as, as straightening and concrete lining anymore. We're looking at, at much, much more friendly, green, you know, environmentally friendly solutions as we look at those things. And, and you will see in the projects they're building, you're seeing that a lot more. Um, but I will also say that I, I would not um, be, uh, um, the coordination that is happening among the multiple agencies uh, is is incredibly significant today, and I would not belittle or dismiss that coordination that's happening. Um, um, Steve, I know that you you are in it on a daily basis, uh, mm. whether it's the Corps of Engineers, whether it's the team that's working on the the um, uh, I'll call it the Ike Dyke, although that's not the name for it anymore. Um, but across the region, looking at these things, and now that the state actually has a a flood planning uh, group that's that's stepping into a larger scale. Um, this is this is a discussion that is not being done in a silo today, which is actually very exciting for addressing flooding um, in in a region. Yeah, no, it's interesting, Carol, because uh, the city has been doing a lot of work with our sister agencies, and we're doing a lot more now. The difference is is that we don't advertise it. I mean, we just go do our job. That's the engineering in us. It's not really the communication side of us. And we've got to do a better job of telling the community, hey, we are doing this with our agencies. Is what we're doing. Good point. And I think that last question that you both uh, addressed there was was also very specific uh, regarding the highway uh, construction project with I-45 and 59 that we've uh, we're currently working on with TxDOT, yet another uh, partner, and in this case one we're uh, trying to really embrace some uh, a paradigm set of shifts and new policies that I know Mayor Turner has been very specific and outspoken about. So I. I with just so little time left in this hour, I know there are other questions that we're gonna want to address. And uh, with that, I, I think I, I will defer to the process ahead, the series of panel discussions that we have coming up with Houston 2020 Visions. I, I do wanna take a moment now at the close of our hour to thank again, all of our panelists for this conversation and to all of the viewers that have asked questions. We know that there are others that we will be responding to and looking to integrate uh, with the presentations that follow. But first of all, with special thanks, I would like to thank Rusty Bienvenu, our executive director with AIA Houston. Rusty's been a, a wonderful partner and collaborator along with his staff members, Jennifer Ward, Tireless and her efforts, and Alex Thrift, our lead designer on the exhibition. Uh, again, uh, soon to open, uh, not just virtually as it is now on the web and uh, with our AIA Houston website and a portal that can be found there, but soon in the Architecture Center Houston itself. I was told by Rusty earlier today that I can go out on a limb and say that he says it's going to be November 9th, that we have that opening. And I know I've announced that to all my colleagues on city council as well as to Mayor Turner, and he has agreed to be among those first visitors, if not the first to walk through the door, to look at all of these wonderful promising practices and visionary uh, ideas for Houston. So with that, uh, we, are, we are about to launch on a series of discussions on a monthly basis. The next one uh, leading all the way through April of 2021 will be a virtual panel to focus on the hubs cluster that's already been talked about and will feature the lily pad network from Stantec and uh, as well as feature uh, the great work of our uh, dedicated staff at the city of Houston with the complete communities program. 
So with that, I encourage everyone to visit the ex exhibition online and register for upcoming updates on the monthly panels. So please visit www.houston2020visions.org. And uh, we anticipate the opening of the Architecture Center uh, less than a month away. So sign up and visit. It will be very safe. We'll require masks. It will be by appointment only in small groups as well as with individuals. So I look forward to seeing you there and online. And again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Chief.